I will now turn it over to Koka Yip, who's our nurse practitioner in the motility clinic and a key member of our team, and she will share her talk on intestinal methanogen overgrowth, or EMO. Okay, so after listening to everybody's talk, man, I hate to be the last speaker for the day because there are so many good things that they have said, and I find myself having some of the uh, repeated information. So what I'll try to do is I'll try to highlight the similarity and differences between archaea and bacteria. Um, this is kind of like a similar layout to Dr. Nasa earlier. It's important to go over what is emo, symptoms of the role of methanogen and diseases, how do we diagnose emo as well as treatment. Uh, the tree might look familiar. I just wanted to point out that, again, gut microbiota can consist of different microorganisms and a population of different microbials that live in the gut, the fairies, depending on each segment of the GI tract that we're talking about. And the impairment of, of the delicate balance of each of these segments uh, matters. Because uh, at the end of the day, SIBO, EMO, whatever it is, it's not an actual infection, just like what they talked about before. It's about excessive growth. And Archaea, in many years ago, just like Dr. Metha, Dr. Pimentel, uh, and the previous speaker had mentioned, it many years ago were grouped together under the bacteria domain of life. And it's until recently that it's got its separate domain. So there are now three domains of life. And this is part of the reason why we have a lot of overlaps between SIBO and EMO. Uh, one of the main differences is that there are um, Archaea and bacteria difference uh, in different ways in terms of cellular structure as well as cellular composition of the cell wall. Uh, one of the things that they have uh, similar in biology is some of the like R RNA that's within their, their cell. The, one of the main methane producing species that uh, have been mentioned before with Dr. Pimentel is the methanobrifidbacter smithia, the M. smithia that we're gonna talk about. The, if we want to highlight the differences between archaea and bacteria, the cell membrane of archaea are kind of biosynthesized in a similar way to our, uh, the way that we make cholesterol. And it becomes important as we talk about treatment, because then we'll talk about statin therapy a little bit. Some of you may know that statin therapy <coughs> is a well-known therapy to treat high cholesterol. It reduces our cholesterol in our human body. And the way that it works is that it kind of interferes with the HMG uh, coenzyme A reductase, and therefore it interrupts and affects the growth of a care in that way. And another difference is that archaea actually lack a polymer called the patoglycan in the cell wall. So therefore, it, it kind of explains why that archaea as compared to bacteria kind of resist into many antibiotics, in particular penicillin. And then lastly, the archaea wall doesn't have the lipopolysaccharides. So our human host systems, the immune response, we're able to recognize archaea, but the way that we respond to archaea is similar to the way that we respond to virus, not bacteria. And then lastly, we want to highlight that there's a very unique metabolic world of archaea is that it produces methane, kind of like what Dr. Pimentel had mentioned before. Here is um, a diagram that we got from a, an article that was published a decade ago. Just like what they had mentioned earlier, the microbiome is very complex, delicate uh, system that we're still trying to learn more and more. Um, what we have gained is that while we're rapidly understanding more and more about it, there's still a lot that we don't know. A decade ago, the uh, authors that had published an article in this World Journal of Gastroenterology had highlighted uh, some of the metabolic, uh, well, especially how the hydrogen, carbon dioxide uh, play a role in synthesis of methane by, methano, uh, by methanogens in our gut. And then, uh, and as you can see, there are a lot of questions marked to different diseases such as obesity, inflammatory bowel disease at the time a decade ago. And now we're getting more and more understanding, although the association is still unclear, but 
there are a lot more that we have known, especially in people who have peritonitis or gum disease. There are detection of methane in those populations, as well as other conditions like uh, inflammatory bowel disease, irritable bowel syndrome, diverticulitis disease. What is interesting is that in the population of anorexia nervosa, these are the populations that have this eating disorder that have, find they have presence of archaea. And what is interesting is that archaea, in the way that they, uh, they have that metabolism, they produce a little bit of amount of energy. And it isn't truly clear or whether it's hypothesized that perhaps in patients with eating disorder, maybe the, it's a body's way to adapt and to see if we can harvest as many calories as possible for the host. Now, the archaea in our gut is interesting. While archaea can live on our skin, in our genital urinary system, it has the largest number in our gut, just like what Dr. Mather pointed out earlier. It could be found in our mouth, in our small bowel, and largely abundance in the colon as well as the appendix. And Dr. Wesai earlier pointed out that perhaps the appendix can be served as a replanting reservoir of archaea in our body. Dr. Nessa had showed this slide earlier and just wanted to highlight that while small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is the overgrowth of bacteria in a small bowel, emo, on the other hand, is the overgrowth of methane producing archaea in the small bowel as well as the colon. So this is what that. And then um, Dr. Nasser also pointed out some of the selected symptoms of microbial overgrowth. Many of them overlap between SIBO, EMO, even SIFO. One thing to highlight is that the patients with methane gas, methane gas has been known to cause constipation, as well as uh, it's associated with irritable bowel syndrome with uh, constipation predominant type, while the uh, hydrogen sulfide causes more diarrhea. Now, as they have pointed out earlier, that SIBO, whether it's SIBO or EMO, these are not primary conditions of our body. And usually, it is a secondary condition due to something else. And Dr. Nessa earlier pointed out some of these more common conditions or risk factors that patients may have that put them at risk for having SIBO or EMO. And uh, these could be like structural abnormality, any kind of underlying dysmotility, like connective tissue diseases, such as lupus, uh, people who are after surgery, such as like having their um, IC valve removed, because then it prevents the protective mechanisms. Uh, like just kind of like the elevator and the guy who's running up against the elevator he was trying to show you. So this pathway has been shown by Dr. Ness earlier. Just wanted to highlight that hydrogen as well as methane are exclusively produced by our gut microbiome. Our human hosts are not capable of producing these gases. And these are the backbone of how breath testing works. And similar to how he explained that while SIBO, SIFO can be assessed by breath tests and perhaps even uh, EGD with small bowel aspiration, EMO at this current time is only going to be able to evaluate it by doing a breath test. And how breath testing work is that while he had already explained the underlying mechanism of how gases get transported from the gut to the lungs and then they exhale in our breath, the, the how we measure the breath test is that we usually use a sugar substrate such as glucose or lactulose. It could be either 10 grams of lactulose or 75 grams of glucose. And what patients do is that at baseline, we have them blow and exhale into a, uh, a bag. And then we give them that sugary substrate. After they drink that sugary substrate, every 15 minutes, we have them collect a breath sample. They do the same exhalation into the bag. And then we measure the amount of hydrogen as well as methane. And in some tests, that's available hydrogen sulfide as well from those sam breath samples. So here is a sample of how the breath test is being reported. It, depending on the facility and where you get the breath test done, now there's, there are two main different ways. People do it in the clinic or in the facility, or some can do it at home. Um, and some of the reporting, a lot of times, will give you the time sequence, because every 15 minutes you blow into a bag, you'll see a number there. Some of them include a diagram, some of them don't. So while SIBO is positive when there is an increase uh, 
amount of hydrogen gas by 20 parts per minute, EMO is different that it is captured by any elevation of methane level above 10 parts per minute at any time point. Because remember, Achaea's uh, EMO is uh, affecting both the small bile as well as colon. So Dr. Anessa had discussed about the three pillars of management of microbial overgrowth. Uh, and the most important is that we need to find out if we could to the best that we can. What are the underlying costs? What are the risk factors that we can modify? If it's somebody with diabetes, how can we optimize and improve the blood sugar control so that we can reduce risk of relapse in these patients? And then induction of remission, kind of like we pointed out, uh, antimicrobial therapy, like antibiotic, uh, elemental diet, and then for emo, interestingly, there's research that's ongoing for the study of statin, because we remember talk about the cell wall differences and how that works. And um, there's also some small data that talk about wet waste uh, yeast extract, and that is related to the differences in, from what I can remember, H form and L form of the low for statin, uh, from the statin therapy. But our ongoing research is needed in this area. And then how we maintain remissions by doing uh, dietary changes and lifestyle modification. Now, in terms of M. smithia, this is the main methane producing microorganism in the gut that we have talked about earlier. It's resistant to antibiotics like penicillin don't work. There are a lot of other antibiotics don't work. And all of all the antibiotics that's available, kind of like what Dr. Nessa had mentioned, Rifaximin is one of the most studied antibiotic. There are some meta-analysis that came out that have looked over 32 different clinical trials. And uh, among those studies, people who have a positive breath test are able to have a good predictor of who will be a good responder to Rifaximin. And uh, in addition, for people who have methane, like what Dr. Nassar pointed out, combination treatment with Rifaximin plus the second antibiotic, such as neomycin, gives greater, even higher success with, in this case, 87%. And the reason behind that is that we believe, perhaps in addition to suppressing methane-producing achaea, by removing the abstract, which is the hydrogen that is there to, uh, that is, the byproduct from bacteria fermentation, if we remove the hydrogen, perhaps we could also you know, get rid of methane that way because they don't have the abstract to make the methane. And then, oh, lastly, uh, for patients who are intolerable or are allergic to neomycin, there is an alternative of using metrodinosol. Elemental diet have been mentioned earlier, and its clinical success has been has some good data, especially to 5 and X plus, which is the pre-digested elemental formula. The amount of 5 and X we use is based on the patient's height and weight. And just to highlight, in case elemental diet is something new or new concept to patients, it is a nutritionally exclusive therapy, meaning that patients who choose to go with an elemental diet. They are not allowed to eat or drink anything else other than this formula. So usually treatment comprises of 14 consecutive days, followed by a breath test on day 15. If the breath test continue to be abnormal on day 15, then they might have to go for seven more days for a total of 21 days of treatment. There are pros and cons of elemental diet. Uh, some of it is that because it's pre-digested, we don't have to worry about uh, potential allergy risk or anything like that. The con is mostly reported of the cost, because a lot of insurance drug plans, they don't cover um, Fibonacs or any other kind of nutritional supplement or elemental diet at all. So it's all out pocket. And the amount or how much it costs, it's different than an individual, because somebody who's smaller, more petite, they may need less cans of the elemental diet versus somebody who's big and tall, they might need more. So uh, they have mentioned there are high recurrence rates of SIBO. And one of the speculations that you know, people may have more relapses or perhaps they are a um, group that have underlying risk factors, doesn't matter if it's elemental diet or antibiotic treatment, it doesn't really fix the wood costs. They are there to reduce down the content of bacterial, microbials, or, or methane-producing archaea. 
So maintenance of emission is important to help prevent these frequent relapses, or at least hopefully we can stretch out the time that people feel good between relapses. So low fermentation eating is a concept that is similar to low FODMAP uh, diet, except it is less restricting. The goal is, of course, to prevent these you know, recurrences or reduce down the frequency of recurrences as much as we could. The concept behind it is that we got to remember that not everything we eat can be digested and used by us. So there are things that cannot be used or digested by us. They just keep traveling down the GI tract, and guess what? They feed these microbials. Um, so the focus is then on high protein, low carbohydrate, so that we can limit these amounts of fermentable carbohydrates to feed the microbials as much as we could. And uh, some of the pitfall that we have known from a lot of patients, because there are patients that come in the clinic and be like, oh my gosh, I'm so 100% compliant to the diet, but I'm still having symptoms, I'm still feeling bloated. And we asked about, oh, what do you eat and what kind of things? Especially there was one uh, patient who love to drink uh, green apple green tea. Guess how much of that fake sugar is in those drinks that we cannot digest? Now, and when it comes to digestible and non-digestible, hard to digest food there, we highlighted some of the um, uh, uh, things that we could digest, such as table sugar. Those highlighted in blues are kind of easier for our body to digest. And the opposite column are those that we should try to stay away from as much as we could. Pretty, pretty much simple carbohydrate, like white potatoes, sweet potato, white bread, French bread, um, anything like that would be better. Try to stay away from dairy as much as possible because dairy uh, contains lactose, which is, um, contains the lactose, which is the milk sugar, um, and it's sometimes difficult to digest. Uh, maybe I shouldn't say do's and don'ts on this. Maybe it's more like green light and yellow and red light on the other column. Um, so there are substitute sugar that is sometimes could be challenging. Uh, while table sugar is good, some patients like to use substitute sugar. If you do, try to stay with equal. Um, proteins and nuts are usually good. Um, veggies are, sometimes we get a lot of questions about vegetables. Uh, pretty much cucumber, tomatoes, uh, those are good. And then remember at breakfast, Breakfast earlier this morning, there are milk substitute, almond milk, oat milk, those are good too. In terms of lifestyle modification, earlier we talked about eating mode and fasting mode of the MMC and how we can promote that. Remember the picture that Dr. Nessa showed you with the ocean waves? How can we optimize so that we have more of those big, strong waves, right? So during eating, our body's small bowels are actively working for us. It helps us mix the food, spread the food, and absorb the food that we eat. And while we're not eating during fasting, this is the time that the bowels cleans up. And every 90 minutes to 120 minutes, we get one of these strong repetitive contraction called the MMC that the doctors had talked to you about earlier. There are four main phases of these MMC, and phase three is the one that is the most important. And it's kind of like another analogy is like if I have a housekeeper who comes to clean my bathroom, clean my hallway, clean my living room, clean my kitchen, and then I have a party, and there are so many guests that just the bathroom just gets so dirty all the time. If she works for me for eight hours, by the time she clean everything and go back to clean the bathroom again, it may be an hour and a half to two hours. But if she works for me for 12 hours, she may be able to rotate back to the bathroom a lot more times so that it, the bathroom gets cleaner. So it's kind of like that if we could do something to maximize that time benefit, such as meal spacing, if we could have discrete meal, for example, between lunch and dinner, between dinner and breakfast, if we could have so many hours, as much as we could possible, to allow these MMC to occur. Another thing is bedtime snacking. There are a lot of patients who um, don't know, or they, they just try so much, but they just cannot keep themselves away from that 9.30, 10 o'clock popsicle or ice cream. You know who you are. <laughs> we have talked about that many times. But if you could stay away from nighttime snacking, that could also help. 
Um, lastly, if you know you try all of the above and you just need the extra help, of course there's the um, low dose erythromycin or a low dose 5 HT4 antagonist such as procolopride that Dr. Nessa mentioned earlier. So lastly, here's the individualized treatment approach of microbial overgrowth. There is what Dr. Nessa talked to you about. In terms of excessive methane or emo, there is the combination broad spectrum antibiotic with bifaximin and neomycin. And then if there's a clinical response, of course we have to educate about any kind of recurrence risk, how do we maintain for remission. And then, uh, and then if there is no clinical response, then we can talk about is it somebody that you know we should consider elemental diet, we treat with a different kind of combination antibiotics are what they need to do. So lastly, for take home, um, we know that the understanding of the world of methanogens in the gut microbiome and it's associated with uh, diseases are a lot of times still not very clear. And, uh, but it's rapidly expanding. At the moment, uh, emo can only be diagnosed through breath testing. So even though there are technologies like EGD, small bowel aspiration, kind of like what uh, Dr. Gabrielle had talked about, it is hard to cultivate as well as do some of those uh, with archaea versus bacteria and fungi. It's much easier to do in the lab. So right now, only breath testing for emo. And then we talked about the three pillars of treatment, identifying the root cause, see what we can treat to modify with factors, uh, induction of emissions, as well as maintenance. Thank you for having me talk to you today.